Hey out there, thanks so much for tuning in to this week's episode of the Brave Files podcast. Hey, listen, before we get started, I want to give a shout out to all of the entrepreneurs, small business owners, writers, podcasters, authors, artists, creatives, well, and the folks who aspire to be any of these things. You are out there doing really brave work day after day, and I am so inspired by your journey. It was for this reason that I created a community to encourage, support, and help you grow personally and professionally, and I invite you to join us. Simply search Brave on Purpose on Facebook and you'll find us. It's free to join, and it's such an engaging and exciting community. I cannot wait to see you there. Don't miss this opportunity to take advantage of such a fun, exciting, and totally free place to communicate and network with people who are doing the same things you are. Okay, so today's guest is somebody that I met through a mutual friend. That friend is Nick North, and Nick happened to be a guest on The Brave Files. You can find him in episode 67 called Becoming Dad. Interestingly enough, Jeffrey Bernstein's story is also about becoming a dad, but in a completely different way. Jeffrey joins me to talk about building a family as a same-sex couple and their journey through surrogacy and having preemie twins that spent a month in the NICU and how he found a voice by blogging his parenting experience in his now viral blog, Not the Mama. This episode is another in a line of stories we've been telling that remind us there are a lot of ways to be and build a family. We discuss how parenting is both very much the same and quite a bit different when you are same-sex parents. But one thing is for sure, all parents have an obligation to love their children fiercely and to teach them open-mindedness. This episode is so engaging that even my audio engineer, Andrew, messaged me to say how much he enjoyed it. He never, ever does that. So grab a beverage of your choice, cozy up, and listen to this episode building a family. Family, love, and perseverance. This is Heather Vickery, and you're listening to The Brave Files, stories from people living courageously. When we choose bravely in big and small ways, it powerfully elevates our lives. I hope these stories connect with you and encourage you to embrace bravery in every possible way, day after day. Together, we can build a movement of courageous living that enriches both our lives and our communities. And if you enjoy the show, I ask you to please share it with others. Maybe think of someone who you want to choose bravely right alongside you. Thanks for tuning in. Now here's the show. Hey everyone, this is Heather Vickery. Welcome to The Brave Files. I am so excited to have you here. Before I introduce today's guest, I just want to ask you, have you checked us out on Patreon yet? Because if you haven't, I hope you'll do that. We're building this incredible, brave movement, and we need your support, but we're giving away some really fun things in return. So head on over to patreon.com slash brave files, see what's available, and do what you can to help us do big, big things and support this incredibly brave movement. Okay, friends. So when I first discovered today's guest, I practically ran to my computer to shoot off a Facebook private message and say, I love you. I love you. Please come on the Brave Files. And um, Jeffrey was wonderful. Jeffrey Bernstein (laughs) said, who who are you? Crazy lady. Um, But I'll talk to you. That's what you said. You were very nice about it. (laughs) So we jumped on a call and I explained really who I am and what we do on the show. And uh, Jeffrey, I'm so glad you're here to to join us. Your story um, is beautiful. You and your husband have built this incredible family via surrogacy. You are parented NICU babies and you all did it while neither of you uh, are the mama. We're going to talk about that. (laughs) So I'm so excited to have you here. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. I'm really, really excited to be a part of this. That's for sure. I appreciate that. And I just have to say up front, I think one of the things that made me click and read more about you is that you spell mama the way I do and nobody else does that. Really? How does anybody else spell mama? M-A-M-A. Oh, M-A-M-A. I didn't even think about that. 
that's so funny. You know, I I don't even think that that was an option when I came, uh, you know, when I put together our page, not the mama. <laughs> that's I love it. I've never seen anybody else spell it. It's M O M M A, and that's how my mama always spelled it, and that's how that's I spell how, it. Exactly, that's how my mom spelled it in the eighties. So I, I guess. I don't know. Maybe or, it's location. Where are you located? Where do you live? So I live in Pennsylvania, just north of the Philadelphia city, but I grew up on Long Island in New York. Oh, okay. All right. Well, and I'm a Midwesterner born and raised, born and raised in Indianapolis and now in Chicago. So I don't know. I love it. Oh, I love it. Everybody though. tell us, text us, tweet us, whatever, and let us know. How do you spell mama? Yeah. How I'm do just, you spell mama? <laughs> I'm really just curious at this point. Um, <laughs> So let's backtrack just a little bit. Jeffrey, tell us a little bit of background um, about who you are and and maybe even what made you decide surrogacy was the right decision for your family. So who am I? That's a that's a great question. <laughs> I know, uh, right? A little existential I? chat for a Thursday. I know, just just a little one. So who am I? I am a 37-year-old gay man, queer gay man. Uh, I'm married to my husband of uh, many, many years. We're actually together, uh, it'll be 15 years this oh, year. What? And legally married five years come May. Uh, okay. How did we decide that surrogacy was the right way for our family to be built? Uh, I think the the basic answer is the law was more on our side to be a same-sex family in Pennsylvania at that time using gestational surrogacy than it was the adoption. That and, makes a lot of sense. And um, I don't want to use terms like unfortunately or sad that we couldn't adopt because I don't want to, I don't want to make one to be, there's no right way to build yep. a family. And Absolutely. I want to make sure I'm very clear about that. And yep. I am very happy and proud of how we are how we were able to make our family come to be, and that I do recognize that there are so many ways that families are created. There is no one right way. So that's yeah. absolutely right. We did. Uh, I did an episode several months ago on adoption. Uh, it was not a same sex family, but we talked about that then. There are there are a lot of different ways, and I can remember. So I used to do wedding planning, and um, I did a number of same sex weddings, and I had one client to two brides and my daughter who at the time was I don't know seven and it, I hadn't come out yet um and my daughter said mama I think that's so cool I'm so glad they're gonna be a family but I'm curious how are they gonna have babies hmm. which was a I didn't even think she knew the technicalities of how babies were made sure, and I sure. and I said well, there are a few different ways. And I kind of laid down. I'm like, there's medical intervention. There's adoption. There are, all, you know, all these things. And she's like, oh, yeah. Okay, cool. Like, mm. you know, she's seven. Like, makes yeah. sense. It may, she moves know, on. <laughs> it's amazing how, how children respond to the most easiest and basic of answers. Yet other people that aren't necessarily within our definition of family tend to overcomplicate things and think it's too challenging for kids to understand. So good Absolutely. on you. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> thanks. They're, they're good kids. That part. They never struggle with that part. Um, so it made the most sense for you legally, which I do understand because you lived in a state that didn't have marriage protection at the time, well, right? We had, we had marriage protection at the time. We were actually, we were fortunate that Pennsylvania overturned marriage equality prior to the country overturning marriage okay. equality. But All right, most same of here. The, most of the adoption agencies were still very religious-based. Mm. And we're making decisions um, not in favor of same-sex couples, most especially same-sex male couples. Okay. And it just wasn't a it wasn't a legal battle that we were willing to travel uphill, sure. nor <laughs> an emotional battle that we didn't. We we just knew emotionally it would be way more challenging to go through that avenue. Yeah. Or we or we thought. Both times. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny how those things shake out. Right? Isn't it is it? funny how those things shake we, out. We get um, we get what we're going to get, interestingly enough, some way or another. But surrogacy is a big decision. It's a wonderful decision. There's a lot of trust and time and yeah. money it's involved. A, that is very tall, very true. <laughs> yeah. How did you find your surrogate? So our process was actually fairly straightforward. 
we wound up just doing some Google searches to understand what surrogacy was, what the definitions of surrogacy, what the legalities of surrogacy were. Um, and we landed up with an agency down in Texas. Texas okay. um, is one of the top states legally for married couples, whether they are same sex or the different gender marriages um, or whatever, however you want to refer to it. Um, mm hmm. And the protections were there for any married couple to be able to undergo a surrogacy journey where one, something that could be issued, which is called a pre-birth order, which establishes parentage prior to any actual childbirth happening, uh, was very important to us. So we wound up signing on with an agency down in Texas who connected us with uh, the woman that ultimately wound up becoming our surrogate. That's awesome. And who would think, Texas? <laughs> yeah, who would think? I, it's funny. The, the the one thing I will say that the surrogacy journey did do was open up my eyes to some of my own, um, uh, let's say, judgments with regard yeah. to location in the United States and how we make generalities about, you know, let's just take the idea of racism. Oh, the, the, the stereotype would be the South is so racist compared to the North where – when you speak to people who have experienced racism one-on-one, -on -one, you know, or one-on-one -on -one would say that, you know, sometimes the, the North is a bit more racist than the South, right? Mm -hmm. So we have these generalities. Uh, I never yes. expected to find a conservative, an amazingly beautiful conservative Texas family who was extremely open to being the, the, the liaison and catalyst for us to be able to build our family. Uh, so wow. we, we met a, a beautifully open-minded, strong, conservative Christian family that wound up caring for us. And it really did open up my mind. I will say I that. I love that. I really, really love that. Um, gosh, we find our gifts in so many unexpected <laughs> packages, <laughs> right? don't we? Uh, and it just goes to show that taking the time to, to talk to people and meet people and converse is so valuable. I've been working with my own unconscious bias or conscious bias, I suppose, in, in spaces like that, um, particularly when it comes to religion and allowing somebody to show me who they are before I assume who they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So you found this wonderful family and it, was it, did it happen quickly? Did pregnancy um, happen so quickly? No, it didn't actually. Um, our journey didn't happen quickly. And while many surrogacy journeys, journeys are are packed with lots of issues. You know, fortunately, the one issue that we really experienced wasn't in getting pregnant. We actually wound up getting pregnant on the very first transfer, uh, which is very unheard of. A lot of people right. have failures yeah. the first transfer, they'll get pregnant the second transfer. Uh, our surrogate was, at this time, it was, she was a second time surrogate, so we were her second journey. What happened was, is us meeting overlapped her last journey with respect to pumping breast milk. Now, while she wasn't pumping for the family in which she had delivered for, she was still pumping to be able to donate milk to oh, wow. NICU banks. What and a woman. She's an amazing woman. And she knows it to this day that I speak so highly of this person. She is very selfless and one of the most amazing people I've met. Um, with that being said, she stopped pumping and started the process of drying out so that she could start her menstrual cycle again, which was part of the requirements for medical right. screening. Yeah. And what we thought would take one month wound up taking almost nine months for her to get her period. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. So that was actually, you know, we were told by or given the option by our agency that if we wanted to move forward, we could match with another family. But at that point in our journey, when we had actually signed our, our, our first retainer, not just with the agency, but with our surrogate, we had already actually been on vacation together. We had been wow. we had been down to Texas to meet with them. They had actually flown up with their whole family. They had two kids up to Pennsylvania to, to meet with us and to, to go to New York City and to take a tour of Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So we had already invested so much personal time in growing and becoming an extended family together that at that point it, it just made sense to wait. Right. It was yeah. the, the end goal wasn't to get pregnant fast and become a family fast, but the end goal was to have healthy children. And if this is the family that we were going to work with and they had already been medically cleared before, there was no reason to not continue to wait and work with the family. So we yeah. decided to wait. I love that. And 
you know, patience pays off. I think it's so incredible that you had sort of built this relationship, family relationship with them. Uh, I have to imagine that what you experienced in being open-minded, they experienced some of the same. Learning 100%. about people. So it, just, it gives me all the warm fuzzies all across the board. Yeah. So nine months <laughs> later. Yeah. So just about nine months pregnant. later. Yeah. It was, um, we met September of 2015 and, uh, I, I, we I'll say it was around February of 2016 is when her period actually came, which meant we had to wait another month before we could contract because she needed to have one natural menstrual cycle. So right. our contracts were signed by uh, May. It was May of 2016. I remember thinking to myself, okay, that means we could, we could do transfer by the end of May, early June. And then we got the, <laughs> We got the email from the clinic around May 20th saying, well, your, ju- your, your scheduled transfers around July 21st and, um, or July 20th, no, it was July 21st. And I looked at my husband that night and I literally screamed. I said, we have to wait another two months. Oh, we just, we wow. just signed our contract. We've waited so, and you know, he, 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 mm-hmm. he completely calmed me down. He said, you know something? <laughs> what's another month? Yeah. What, what, at the end of the day, what's another month? So yeah, we, um, so July 21st love- was the, uh, that was our transfer date. And it wound up being that it was a great day because it was my aunt's uh, or is my aunt's birthday as well. So. Oh, have fun. And yeah. you learned so much about patience. <laughs> I learned a lot about patience. Little you did I know. You can take that into parenthood. <laughs> I, yeah, I take, little did I know that that little, that little lesson would be uh, in, what's it called? Multiplied, uh, exemplified once I had toddlers. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, let me just tell you, friend, you're going to long for the toddler years when they're teenagers. So... I, I can't wait. I, <laughs> actually, I can wait. I'll use wait. this time. Yeah. <laughs> Enjoy. Enjoy. Um, so pregnancy went as normal as expected. So, yeah, absolutely. You know, we, um, we did a lot of preparation prior to transfer in trying to understand the risks of having a multiple pregnancy. And we knew that there were some risks with it. Uh, our surrogate also knew that there were risks. She had actually carried twins for her first surrogacy journey. Uh, with that being said, yeah, as far as multiple pregnancies are concerned, it was pretty much a easy pregnancy up until around week 29. Um, mm. uh, I will say that we did have a little bit of a pregnancy scare at around the 21st week. I flew down to Texas for the 21 week anatomy scan to be with our surrogate. And during the exam, the ultrasound technician, I think, had spotted um some sort of a spot on one of the neonates' hearts. And, oh yeah, it was, our, it was really our first sort of introduction into, I guess, the infallibility of pregnancy and how not yeah. all pregnancies are as smooth as people think and not all, you know, just because somebody can get pregnant doesn't mean that they're going to have a healthy baby. So yeah. we were told that the spot that they found was a, a strong indicator of Down syndrome for one of the children, So, you know, my husband and I had already had major discussions well before getting pregnant about what would happen, you know, if we had a Mm. child that had special needs or with a Down syndrome baby. And uh, we it didn't affect us either way. So we were we were fully prepared. And a couple of I think it was about a week later, we found out that this spot that they saw was non-existent anymore. And it was just, a, you know, I guess an image that had reflected in the in the scan. So we were like, okay, great. Um, yeah, you know, the 29th week came around and we got a call from our surrogates. She was spotting and, um, in the routine exam, they wound up admitting her to the hospital and, uh, we found out that she was, her cervix was thinning, which is usually a sign of getting ready to deliver. Effacement. Uh, I've been there. Done that four times. (laughs) Yep. I'm not one to educate you on it. I'm not going to mansplain that. That's okay. I appreciate that. (laughs) Nope. I appreciate that. Uh, But it did help us learn a lot about the the physical stuff of pregnancy. That's for sure. Um, Either way, she was in the hospital for a total of, I think, 24 hours. Uh, They put her on some medicine. Uh, They gave her some steroids just in case there was an early term birth to make sure that the, um, you know, the the neonates could have some long time development. Uh, And whatever they did that day wound up holding off delivery until week 33. And on Friday. Oh, wow. And That's was, a big deal. It That's was a, a huge, it was a long yeah. time. I mean, whatever the doctors did bought my babies or our babies um, 
some extraordinarily valuable uh, in utero time. So yeah, at 33 yeah. and zero, she uh, she texted my husband while we were at work. I think it was around 7:15 in the morning. I was already off in Jersey at work, and and you know Brian also was at work. And she said, I don't know if I peed last night in my bed or Uh-oh. if um, <laughs> something else is going on. But yeah. um, I'm experiencing something that I've never experienced before. And we learned at that point that she never actually had her water break with either with all three of her pregnancies. Oh, wow. So she didn't know what she was experiencing. And what uh, what we ultimately learned is, is that our baby boy, uh, who is now two and a half, decided to try and flip while he was breech. And uh, he popped his sack, and that started early labor at 33 and zero. 33 oh, wow. weeks and zero days, sorry. That's, uh, is this, that's is this indicative of the type of child he is? Yes, and that is, <laughs> let me tell you, he has been first on, first on, first on. He is always first to jump on things. He just likes to, yeah. to dive right in. But yeah, yeah, we had an early term birth at 33 weeks, which uh, for those that don't want to do the math, they were born at seven months. And uh, that, unfortunately, usually means that there is some NICU time. And we wound up up being in the NICU for uh, almost exactly a month, actually, for both babies. I feel like, and I I have been very blessed, none of my babies, well, my two (gasps) oldest babies had little heart murmurs, but they were never long-term NICU. It was just short while I was still there in NICU. So, but, uh, but I hear stories of people being children being in much longer than a month. So I'm, I'm glad that it wasn't longer than that. Although I'm sure that month was pretty harrowing. At what point did you start your blog, not the mama? So not the mama didn't actually start until six months later after we, okay. yeah, it didn't start until much later. Um, we were in the hospital from February 17th until March 23rd. <clears throat> and I don't think I actually got the domain for not the mama until that August. Now I had already decided to write to our children. So the blog or what became the blog had already been birthed, so to speak. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I had, we had already been documenting our journey for quite some time through social media, but mainly through our, you know, our personal pages and through a GoFundMe that we had set up for our friends and family to be able to help us on the journey. Um, I didn't really yeah. expect what happened to grow into what it has grown into. Um, I didn't expect people to connect one to a same sex family, let alone to a same sex family undergoing, you know, a NICU stay. I, I just didn't expect it to connect with the public. Uh, and <clears throat> every night that we were in the NICU, the way that it did. Yeah. The way that it did. It just, I, had, I, I didn't expect it to grow in, you know, our very first night in the NICU, I, I sat there with my husband in the car driving home and we wrote our very first letter to our children. Aww. Actually, it was really technically our second letter. Our first letter was uh, before, way before they were born. It was our letter to the surrogate, which we addressed our future children in. And in that first letter, I think it was a matter of three lines uh, telling them that they were loved and that they were going to be okay and that they were strong. And yeah. I don't know why I decided to post it online, but I, I posted it as a way, since we were in Texas and most of our friends and family were all up in Pennsylvania, right. really as a sense. way to, to help them stay in touch uh-huh. and for us to, to digest, I guess, what was going on and just sort of get it out there. And then it turned into an everyday thing. And while they were in the hospital, every single night at the end of the day, at the end of every day, we would write a letter to our children to let them know how they did that day, some of their challenges, some of their successes. And it turned into a, it turned into a book ultimately that we made just for our children and for our parents, like we, you know, through mixed books, you know, so we, you know, we, we, and I still do it to this day. Every six months, I write them a letter. And they will get a letter every six months, uh, hopefully until the day I'm not able to write a letter anymore. Oh, that makes me weepy. <laughs> I love that. I, I love, we love doing it. We'll sit down usually a month before and we'll start, you know, writing what it is we want to talk about. And yeah, I, uh, I, we love it. We love it. Yeah. Oh my gosh. What a gift. And I've always felt there's something extra magical about children via surrogacy or adoption. And I, and I know but my children are not adopted, so I know that there are, it, there are layers to all of that. But mm. the what you parents have to go through, you you can always look your children in the eye 
and they will know they were so wanted. Yeah. And that's such a gift. It is a gift. I, isn't in a day go by that I still, I still look at my children. I mean, they've been born now for well over two and a half years and I still go, am I a lot of curse? Because uh, I, I, I'll look and I'll be like, shit, these are my kids. <laughs> I never expected this. Like, I, yeah. to this day, it still amazes me. And it keep, oh, it's still amazing. It is so great. So let you, you referenced the way that the blog has taken off. Just speak to that for a, a moment. What do you do with it? And, yeah, what's the response so, you're getting? Yeah, here's the, the blog really focuses on parenting. <clears throat> and I try to keep it through a queer family lens, through you know, you know, the eyes of same-sex parents and some of the challenges mm-hmm. that we face. And I'm pretty blunt about some of the things that we face, uh, especially in the beginning when I was home alone with the kids and Brian was back to work, uh, you know, whenever I'm out. And this is actually sort of the genesis of why I call the blog Not the Mama. Uh, but, you know, when the kids were three months old and four months old, I would need to get out of the house with them just to, to yes. shake things up. And I would go to Target or go food shopping or I go wherever it is that I needed to get done, even if it was a 30 minute trip outside and I would chronically be asked, Oh, you're such a good daddy. Are you giving mama a break? Oh yeah. And you know, the assumptions, the assumptions of all the straight yes, people. <laughs> yes. The assumptions of the cis heteronormative world that all yeah. families have a mom and a dad and the secondary assumption that if a dad is with their children, they, of course, must be giving mom a break. Now, right. <laughs> which I'll tell you has really helped open up my eyes on the world of sexism, both on mm. the masculine and the feminine side of it, and how we both, or how both sexes can experience it, but also that all sexes experience it in various ways. And some of the assumptions that are made are definitely rooted in patriarchy, don't get me wrong, but I, um, I just wind up always saying, no, nah, I'm not the mama. Like there is no mama here. So yeah. we are a two dad family. <laughs> that, no mama's here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no mom's here. I don't need a mom or, you know, no mom is needed in this family. And they always are so shocked. Well, who changes their diapers? Who, who gets what? them dressed? Oh man, <laughs> Heather to this day. And I'll braid my, I'll braid my daughter's hair. And I love sitting down and braiding her hair and I will bust a braid out. Let me tell you, um, and people will still to this day ask, oh, did mommy braid your hair? And oh she looks at them and says, no, my ABBA braided. Like, and oh that's, my, my, that's my two and a half year old already starting to get sassy about things like that. Yeah. And, uh, I, and I am the mama and I can't braid hair to save anybody's <laughs> life. And then so I maybe you can that teach that. me. I, I YouTube with my friend many years ago. So I can say I, YouTube and, and I'm, I'm, I'm Jewish by nature and by, by rearing. So I learned how to braid challahs very early on, challah breads. So, I love that. <laughs> and I love a good challah bread too. So there you go. <laughs> so your, the blog is about parenting. Is there um, an element of, you know, helping, calling people on their biases? Yes. And I yeah. know that you have been a follower in the short period that we've known each other. And yes, I use that space as a space for people that want to share opinions to share opinions, but my one caveat is, is that it needs to be in a very accepting manner. And yes. I choose acceptance versus the word tolerance because I don't, oh, yeah. I don't tolerate hate in any form. And that could be in yeah. the form of sexism. It could be in the form of, and I won't use terms like homophobia anymore. I will use terms like homomysia or queer misia because at the end of the day, it's not a fear that these people have. It is a definite hatred towards. Um, yeah. So I don't allow certain things as far as responses are concerned. And perhaps the most controversial post that I've had on the blog came earlier this year during Pride Month. Um, you know, I've been an ally for other marginalized communities in my actions. And in one way that I align myself with the actually autistic community is on June 18th is Autism Pride Day. Now, you know that June is Pride Month for the Correct. LGBT and queer community. Yes. But yes. the intersection is actually not that of those who are autistic and queer, but rather a day that the autistic community has claimed as their own, ironically, during June to celebrate their autism. So I made a post right. out there to celebrate those who I know are my autistic friends. Sure. And um, the the post is very well received by those who are autistic, but not very well received by those who claim to be supporters oh. of 
autism. And I specifically say autism because a lot of the, I'm just going to call it out like it is. A lot of the quote unquote autism moms came out saying, you know, how dare you? How dare you? We try so hard. And I, I try to give a platform to those who are marginalized in their voices, not to those that claim to be marginalized because they happen to have a child who is X, who is Y. You know, often we as parents, <laughs> we as parents can play the martyr card when we have a child that has special needs sure. or is different, is this, is that, as opposed to just lifting them up and maybe listening to adults who have had the same issues but are older and might be able to help better guide us to make better parenting decisions, sort of the concept of know better, do better. Um, right. So what were they angry about? Uh, they were angry at the way in which people frame certain therapies that are uh. covered by insurance for autism, specifically ABA, Applied Behavioral uh, Analysis, and many okay. autistic adults that are part of the actually autistic community are very adamant against ABA and that it causes post-traumatic stress disorder and, and whatnot. Oh, wow. And I am not a, a, not an expert by any stretch of the means in any of it. However, I do consider myself a co-conspirator with those who I know are marginalized. And if yeah. autistic adults and research is showing that there's PTSD attributed to certain types of therapy, then who am I to disagree with that? Um, I'm, right. I, I, <laughs> I mean, that's a, you can go down the rabbit hole with that from a, a vaccination standpoint. Exactly. Um, I vaccinate my kids, but I stretch out the vaccinations. I won't give more than two shots at a time because I think it's too much. But, and you that's know, okay. So I'd rather come back in two months and do it repeatedly. Uh, I try not to, I just believe that most people are trying to do the best job they can as a parent. That's it. And I just don't think anybody goes into it saying, I'm really going to try and F these kids up. I hope not, because, you know, <laughs> if that's your reason for getting into parenting, I don't want to know that person. <laughs> yeah, right? And so judging is just difficult because everybody's journey is different. So exactly. I appreciate I'm laughing at you. I'm a co-conspirator rather than the word ally. Can yes. we just... We can definitely Dude, talk that about that. That was intentional, that was and I'd like to know why. Yeah. Because I don't like the way, and I, this is going to come across maybe a little bit cocky, but I'm definitely one of those <laughs> that are guilty of using ally as a badge. And I don't think that ally is something that you as a person should earn. I think it's something that you as a person should do. And if you're going to... Ally in verb align, form. Exactly. Ally in verb form. And I'd rather be a co-conspirator and actually get out there, get my hands muddy, and do the work. And have somebody call me an ally to the community than me actually badge myself with that when all I'm doing is maybe, you know, nodding a few hats here. So I prefer the yeah. term conspirator. And it's been right. it's been an evolution, actually. I used to be uh, I used to love the term ally until I saw people who call themselves allies, myself included, hurting those they thought they were allying against. Mm. Because when an ally steps into a space that's not theirs to step into and overshadows the voices that are trying to be heard. And I'm sure you as a parent have seen non-parents give you advice. Oh, yeah. Uh, right? Me as a, as a gay man have had non-queer folk try to tell me how to, how to experience things or, or whatnot. It's important that as allies and as co-conspirators, we know when to step back and let the people who are actually marginalized that you're yes. co-conspirating with to step up and let their voices be heard. So that's why I like yes. open theater. So there's yeah. no long spiel to it. Oh, I love it. I think it's, I think it's great. And I do a lot of work, uh, as an, as an ally, as an advocate, as a co-conspirator in much like you in every possible way for a marginalized group, uh, in particular anti-racism. And there are some spaces where I need to shut up and let other people talk. And there are some where, my privilege allows me to be heard more readily and mm -hmm. it's my obligation yes. to use it. I, if I could give you a high five right now, I would. <laughs> I love it. Virtual high fives. Yeah, virtual high five. <laughs> I dig it. Uh, Jeffrey, I'm wondering, do you believe that being same sex parents changes anything at all? in your experience for yourself, your husband or your kids? Yeah, absolutely. I do. 
And Can you tell us yeah, some I'm, of it? I'm, I'm happy to. It's funny because early on in the blog, I got in touch with a gentleman named, and I'm going to use his online name. His name is Spike Malenka. Uh, he's one of the founders <laughs> of uh, Families of Multiples, which is a writing platform. And one okay. of the very first, you know, you can check out, I'm not doing a plug. I don't get paid for writing for them. I do it straight up because I enjoy writing and I, I like sharing my experience as a same sex father. Um, but either way, uh, the very, one of the first pieces he had me write was the differences between same sex families and different sex families. And it was a tongue in cheek piece that really focused on routine and how parenting really is not all that different with regards to the physical aspects of parenting, i.e. waking up with your kids in the middle of the night, changing diapers, right. right? Teaching them the ABCs, repetition, discipline, positive reinforcement, um, you know, singing songs, et cetera, et cetera. However, there are some very unique experiences that same-sex families and children from same-sex families inevitably will experience that other children won't, especially if they're from a more, and I don't like using the term traditional, but if they're from a different sex family, like, you know, one with a mom and a dad. Um, for example, constantly having to fight the assumption that there's a mom. And if I'm, yeah. or my husband's out with the children, and, you know, the children are now at, a, at an age where they're starting to really understand words that are being thrown out and phrases around them, that when someone says, where's a mommy? You know, my daughter's now able to say, I have a, I have a daddy and an Abba. I, I don't have a yeah. mommy. Um, so fighting this idea of heteronormativity is definitely a challenge, but the reality is, is that, and, and I think, and maybe I'm naive in saying this because of the spaces in which I hang out in, most of us who are same sex families and have children, because again, being a family doesn't mean you have to have children. You can be, of a, course not. So I, yeah. Yeah, I just want to make um, that I'm not only referring to those, but those of us that have children, what we try to do, and, and correct me if you've had a different experience, is we try to use literature. We try to use children's books yeah, to sure. explain and show that our families are the same and that all families come in different shapes and sizes. So part of our daily routine when the kids are with me right now, they're in daycare part-time or school part-time during the day. But when they're with me on Thursdays and Fridays throughout the day, we have various story times where we're reading about different families. So my children that. have known about families with moms and dads. My children know about families that have grandparents raising the children. My mm -hmm. children know about families that have, you know, moms and dads who are in rehab because they are, they're not well enough to be able to take care of their children and that the mommy and daddy are working to get themselves better and healthier. My children know families with two mommies and two daddies. And we also make an effort to have friends that actually uh, emulate yes. that. So in our, in our yeah. life. You know, just a couple of weeks ago, my kids and I went to a fabulous place down here uh, in the Philly area called the Please Touch Museum. We were with two families. One of them is a a different sex family, a, sex, a family with a mom and a dad. And the other family was a... I just love that term. I'm sorry. I've never actually, I can't believe I've never heard it. It's it's like turning it on its head a little bit. Like know, everyone right? wants to call same sex family, same sex family. Yep. And then if it's not a same sex family, it's, it's just a different, different assumed family. Yep. that it's a a heteronormative family, a, di a different sex family. And what a great way to, to say, if you're going to label us, we can I'm, label everything. I mean, we can label everything. They're a different sex family, right? And what? what? I, and then the other family that was with us was, and I can't even say, I'm going to give them the respect and the honor and say that they're a same sex family, but they're also, I'm going to, you know, they're a queer family as well because one of the dads is a trans dad. Yeah. And, you know, I want my family, my children to know all families. I don't want them just to know that families are a mom and dad and, uh, you know, two children with a white picket fence, a dog and a cat in the yard, you know, and all those other things that we I grew up it. between the 50s and the 80s of what was supposed to be a family so I love it I think it's great <laughs> and you know kids are so funny my um I, I share stories as they're relevant with my different kids but when when I first came out so I, you know my family my same sex family experience didn't happen for my kids until they were older I came out at 38 but right after that my second child who was in third grade at the time just like maybe a month after it was so funny and I'm friends with the teacher because my kids go to a, a small school and um they were reading and tango makes three in the classroom <gasps> oh we love that book <laughs> which is such a great book a great if y'all don't have it and you have kids oh you need little, that book I don't care you if you're a book. queer family or not you need the book exactly like, it's exactly such a great book <laughs> so they read the book and my my third grader who was probably uh 
not even nine yet at the time. She's probably eight because her birthday's in the summer. She raised her hand and she was like, we know that book really well because my mom's gay. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, I had just come out. It just was so easy for her to do because of her exposure. And I felt like that was such a fun, a fun gift. It really is. I'm curious uh, throughout all of this, the decision to go through surrogacy, having babies in the NICU, um, starting this blog and just sort of putting your all in into raising these wonderful, well-rounded, fully fleshed out humans. Does this work feel brave to you? And I say work because I'm telling you, parenting is work. work. Oh, goodness gracious. Yes, it is work. Um, And I say that with emphasis not to complain. Just in case there no, are listeners that think I'm complaining about it, yeah, because I no, wouldn't I don't trade. Think so. I wouldn't trade a darn bit of what we've gone through for anything. Absolutely, um, I wouldn't trade it for a damn thing. Actually, um, I'm going to actually ask you to repeat that because I, I just does it feel brave? Brave. Does that, everything you're going through, what you're doing, does it make you feel brave? So when you said brave, it reminded me of a conversation I had with another gay friend of mine who was also going through surrogacy at the same time. And he and his husband uh, were also expecting twins. And about a year after our twins were born, their twins are about two and a half, three months younger than ours. We happen to be talking about this idea of bravery and crossing over into the world of the, the straights, as some of as some of us call it uh, in the in the gay community. Um, mm-hmm. And we were talking about how brave we were in having families and being the first real generation of gay men to use surrogacy as opposed to adoption, you know, and and whatnot, right. and how the evolution has gone. So so fast and so far in the last 20 years for queer rights that I don't ever think of myself as brave. I'm not going to lie. He and I agreed to disagree at the end of that conversation because for me, I never, I've never looked at what I do as brave at any of it. And I'm being very, I hear that a lot. No, I hear that a lot. I, I don't think what I'm doing is brave because for me as a human being, this has been what I've wanted to do with my life since as early as I can remember. And if, living your life is something that's brave, then sure. Yeah, I'm brave. But I remember early on lamenting. And by early on, I'm talking between the ages of six and 10, lamenting that I would never have children because, you know, families that have children always have a mom and a dad. And I never knew any same sex families uh, that had children. So it it just, and you knew even then that you were gay. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, I knew, I knew very early on. I could, I can point to memories between the ages of three and four in preschool. Um, that really strongly indicate that I was different um, that way. I, I had wow. given up that idea and dream that I would never have a family. So when the option and the opportunity came around, it just seemed normal to me. It, there's nothing brave about it. I understand mm-hmm. why people think it's brave, especially those that aren't within our own community, because it's like you're leading a life that's different. Oh, well, you're going to subject your children to this and you're going to do that. That's selfish or you're, you're going to expose your children to hate. Oh, girl, some of the things that... You just made brave so negative, though. But, it's, not, that it's not like that. No, it's not. It's not. To me, it's not. To me, exactly. this is, to me, this is just living my life and living and open so, and proud that I'm creating... Yeah. That those of us that are creating families and we're not the, the normal, that yeah. what we're doing is we're paving the way for the future... And that, yeah, for sure. that to me is, I guess, maybe the bravest thing we could do without even thinking about it. Well, that's the whole point. I'm so glad you got there. Yeah, and, that, um, and that's where I was getting at is that I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm not doing this to be brave. I'm Correct. doing this so that other young children that were like me know that they can have a life like this if they want. That if they want to have a family this way, that they can. Yeah. That it's possible. That any I, of it is possible. And I do think that it's brave from where I sit because you have a choice to just quietly raise your family and That's keep true. to yourself. That's and true. you're out you're out and loud in about everything in the most magical of ways so that you can make life easier for your children and for other children. And you don't have to do that. You know, you said something earlier in our conversation that is very poignant to hear and now 
and that you said that in certain spaces when you're speaking about racism, it's important for you to step back and listen. And in other spaces, it's important to use your privilege and speak up and out. Mm-hmm. And while what you've done, what I've done, and other families like ours have done are brave, those of us that, that speak out, especially those of us that have privilege to be able to do it and have a platform, yes. I, don't, I, mean, I don't want to get crucified for this, but we should. No, no, we're obligated to. We're You're obligated not going to get crucified. Yeah. I mean, if I were to sit back as a simple white gay man with a family and not speak out and help others, yeah. I think it would be the strongest disservice to any community, whether they're gay or not, or any marginalized community, really. Because I we can agree. all draw inspiration from one another, whether it be through... It really doesn't matter what area that a person is marginalized. If they see another marginalized community person speaking up, they can draw strength in being able to then self-advocate for themselves. For sure. And I mean, on the on the pecking order of hierarchy, you've got white man and you've got white gay man. Exactly. Like you're, and, and then you've got white woman, and I pass as a straight white woman, um, right? And so we're very, at the very very top of the the hierarchy of privilege and i just take it very responsibly you and me both. it's very important you and yeah. me both. um and part of my mission with this show is to i want you to be knowledgeable about the fact that it is brave to do this because brave is contagious and you can help somebody else be brave not everybody has the life experience the privilege the courage that you have, and when they see you choosing bravely, they go, maybe I can do that too. Well, if that's if that's how I, I'm going to adopt that attitude, I like that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I, like I appreciate that. it. Although I'll still remain <laughs> as humble as I can. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I, you know, confidence is not does not make you not humble. Um, that's a whole. That's a whole that's other a whole, interview. Yeah, that's, like, that's a whole other area we could talk about. <laughs> but this is a great time, though, for me to ask you: um, How do you celebrate? So, so many milestones, so many things happening, and even now. And and I'm a big fan of of finding five reasons a day to celebrate something. But how do you like to celebrate? Well, it depends on what we're celebrating. Um, but no, Fair. Um, how do we celebrate? We celebrate however we want, usually with simple joys. We like dancing. We like yes, dancing and me singing. Too. Um, yep. So we'll celebrate with a song. My husband loves to sing around the house, although he'll never sing out in public, but he'll sing a song <laughs> for almost anything, which we love. I love. Um, and he always complains that I don't sing nearly enough. Um, but we try, I, I think the, the biggest lesson that Nick, you taught us, was that every little milestone is important to celebrate, no matter how small. I remember us celebrating the first time we went 24 hours without a bradycardia. I remember the first, uh, bradycardia is where the the child's heart rate drops below or drops too quickly. Um, Thank you. You're you're fine. Um, I remember celebrating the first time, uh, you know, our child was able to take a bottle without bradycardia or without, you know, choking. So, we celebrate life and everything every day, every minute. And I love it. We don't just have like, so like, for example, like we have their birthday, right? We celebrate that. We also have their transfer day, which we celebrate transfer day. As I had said earlier on the podcast is on July 23rd. Love, love, love. Uh, yes. We also celebrate take home day, sort of like how folks that have adopted children celebrate mm-hmm. gotcha days. Right. Uh So the day that we came home, March 23rd in our home is, you know, something that we will we will likely always celebrate. But, you know, we have little traditions that go with each of them. Uh, You know, on July 22nd or July 21st for transfer day, we're always going to have McDonald's French fries because that is part (laughs) of the the transfer routine. Once transfer is done, you eat McDonald's French fries. That's just how the super. Why don't you? Of course. Why not? Right. Yeah. Um, (laughs) uh, And just like, you know, we'll always write letters. So. I guess I, I guess where I'm getting at is the NICU taught us to celebrate everything without having to have a reason to celebrate. Yeah, I, I am an advocate of that. Yeah. I, I celebration and shared celebration causes so much joy and joy shared is joy returned. And there's so much to be grateful for in that. I totally agree. Well, I have a feeling that 
you and I, A, are, I hope, we're going to be friends. I, like, I hope so. I'm looking yeah, forward to continuing conversations. I think we could talk for a long time. Uh, but we do have to close this show out for now. Understood. Maybe we can have you back on. So I get to ask you a question that's very near and dear to my heart, which is what is your favorite charitable organization to support? And it is totally an easy answer. For me, I like, we like supporting the Trevor Project. Um, yeah. The Tremor Project. Tell, tell folks what it is. Yeah. So the Tremor Project gives hope. And the easiest way for me to say is it gives hope to LGBTQ and queer youth that tomorrow is going to be better. And yeah. when I was coming out, something like this did not exist at all. And I remember a few years ago, I came in second place for the Philadelphia Health Hero Contest. And this was the organization that we had donated to or that I had donated to. Uh, and it's so, so, so important. Charter Project launched a 24-7 suicide hotline and suicide prevention hotline for uh, LGBTQ youth. And their mission is just so, it's just so near and dear. I, I wish I could speak more highly about it. So. Yeah, well, it's very highly. So, folks, I ask you every week. Uh, I'm familiar, very familiar with the Trevor Project. But if you're not, get to know them. We'll have links in the show notes. And whatever you are able to give, whether that's time or money or social media likes and shares, whatever it is, um, I urge you to get involved. The more we are involved in these different organizations and connected with our communities, the stronger and better we will all be for it. So I love that. Jeffrey, I do have one more question. Sure. Um, I could be opening, I could be opening a can of worms here, or maybe it's an easy one. Do, is your family still involved with your surrogacy family? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love just, that. Just yesterday um, was our surrogate, I'm not going to speak her age, but it was her birthday. No, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so last night after dinner, uh, we got some video of the kids singing her happy birthday. And they, they call her aunt. I'm going to keep her name confidential. But they, yeah, they know her by, let's just say, aunt surrogate for right now. Uh, but they <laughs> sang her a happy birthday video last night. And uh, we found out that she's planning to come up for their third birthday in February. So, yeah, we are very oh, much wow. still in touch with the whole family. Uh, I mean, without them, we wouldn't be the family we are right now. So yeah. I, we are forever grateful and love them for all that they are. I love that so, so much because I, lo I love love. I, the more people and children can be loved, the more people to love them, the better. I agree. So what a gift. I agree. Jeffrey, will you share your three words with us one last time? Absolutely. Family, love, and perseverance. Yeah, I think we... Uh, I think we fully got into all of those things I agree with um, you. and they're beautiful words. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> Sometimes Thank we have to dig you. in a little at the end of the show. <laughs> yeah, no, I think we talked about it I think it it's all. wonderful. I think we talked yeah, about it This was all. such a great conversation, Jeffrey. Thank you so very much Thank for being you. here with me today. Oh my goodness. Thank you for chasing us through. I think it was through Nick Norris that we wound up getting connected. So I'm glad that oh he was, gosh. I'm glad he was able to share that story that was published on, uh, on the interweb. So that's awesome. Yeah, I think it was Nick. Shout out to Nick. If y'all haven't listened to oh. Nick's episode, I, I don't do. know off the top of my head which episode. You should listen. And they have a great movie out uh, called Just Another Beautiful Family. Yes, please check their family out. Oh, you got to watch great it. great family. I cried the whole time. I tried really hard not to cry because I wanted to be able to see the TV. The second time I watched it, I let myself kind of go a little bit more. But I just I love, I love seeing families like that because there's just there are no barriers that none of us can't break if we don't allow ourselves to always just be our authentic selves. Ah, oh, well, that there's a good close right there. I don't have <laughs> a whole lot else to say. Um, just listeners do that. Go out and, and love one another and, and spread it far and wide as if it were confetti. And <laughs> right. And I just do it. that and, and be yourself, be your authentic self. I would love to hear what y'all think of this show, how we can do better. If there's a guest you want to have on anything like that, all you have to do is give me a call at 312-646-0205. I really mean it. I, I love those calls. I will respond to you. And that's exciting. Right. So do that for me. Um, and just Wherever you go today, whatever you do, be your most authentic self and spread a little love, whether that means a smile or a door held or, you know, reach out to somebody maybe you haven't talked to in a while, whatever that means for you, it, it 
in honor of Jeffrey's beautiful family, go out and love a little bit extra hard today. This is Heather Vickery reminding you today and always to go out and choose bravely. The Brave Files is proudly supported by Audible. If you enjoy listening to podcasts, you're sure to love listening to your favorite books on Audible. Get your free 30-day trial complete with a credit for a free audiobook download today simply by visiting audibletrial.com slash the brave files. Again, that's visiting audibletrial.com slash the brave files. You've been listening to The Brave Files, stories from people living courageously. To learn more about the show, find our show notes, or get some great bonus content, visit thebravefilespodcast.com. And we'd love to know what you think. You can give us a call at 312-646-0205. Let us know your thoughts on the episode, the show in general, or maybe share with us how you're out choosing bravely. This episode is brought to you by Vickery & Co. Success Coaching, coaching that helps you maintain a life well-lived and a business well-run. Learn more at vickeryandco.com. Our music is produced by Matt Lewis. Follow him on Instagram at mattmmusic or visit his website, theunionband.com. We couldn't do any of this without our extraordinary audio engineer, Andrew Olson. Learn more about him and check out his work at findandrewolson.com. And special thanks to our associate producer, Kim Statler. I'm your host and executive producer, Heather Vickery. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll talk to you next week.